Okay. Happy Sunday, everybody. Hey, glad to see you guys here. We have some people filtering in, and that's wonderful. Um, well, it, first off, let's uh, thank Aircraft Spruce for sponsoring uh, our, our webinars over this, this last three days and uh, for Kevin being here on a Sunday afternoon. He could be golfing, and I'm sure his golf swing is perfect. Um, being a retired airline captain, he's got all the time to do that kind of fun stuff. Um, so again, thank you for Aircraft Spruce for sponsoring our, our, our three-day uh, webinars. We appreciate that very, very much. Uh, and a lot of you uh, have gone to the gathering with PACA and you know what it's all about. Um, we had a lot of fun. Here's a little, here's last year's group photo. I think we had like 80 people show up. It was a lot of fun. Um, the door prizes, the, 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 the conversations are phenomenal. Uh, great sit down, dinner, lunch, camaraderie. The, the friendships you make are just outstanding. Um, so maybe I'll put the floor or, or hand the floor over to Kevin and he can do a okay. soft intro here. Okay. Hey, everybody. I'm going to go, um, wait, before I do anything, let me sh get my screen share and make sure I've got that going on. Um, pretty sure I do. Hang on. See, that's what we're going to do the extra minutes for. Okay, I got, oh, there it is, share. There's a share button. Son of a gun, there it is. There we are. Okay, there we go. I hope everybody can see that. Um, I can, and that's the important thing. I can. Um, Okay, I'll start in a minute. Uh, basically, this is just a short talk on things that I've screwed up and I've survived. I, I was going to write a book about this, and I've got about 50 of these things, but I picked three for today because we're all mortal. We're all going to die someday, and you don't want to waste a lot of time on this. Uh, but anyway, I picked three interesting ones I hope you like. Um, I'm going to ramble on and go through just a few slides. I hate PowerPoint with a passion, but I end up using it anyway. But I'm trying to use it minimally, so I apologize in advance for the slides, but I hope I make them interesting. Uh, on the screen, you probably see uh, Pete Dead Meat Thompson from Hot Shots. I don't know, if you haven't seen that movie, you're not an aviator. So after this, go see it. And uh, that's, he had the line, I'm in a jet, what could go wrong? And then, of course, he killed himself. But anyway, you're going to find a lot of movie references in my talk, and there's a reason for that. I'm an airline pilot, and most of us uh, spent most of our lives watching movies in layover hotels. And I flew with a lot of Navy guys, and on the ship, on cruises, that's all they did was watch old movies. So we could pitch each other movie lines, and if I would say, uh, looking good, uh, Billy Ray, the other guy could give me the answer from, uh, from the movie, and it, it just kind of interweaves our lives. So there'll be some movie references in here. Um, I'll tell you what they are as they come along. But um, it's better than stock art. And I stole this off Google, but hopefully they won't sue me. Uh, the other caveat I got before I really get into this is these are the things I remember. And memories, <laughs> memories, as you probably know, aren't that good. I mean, I have remembered them right. I'm sure I remembered them favoring me better than they really did. Um, also, one last thing before we go on. If anything I talk about is illegal, just assume I never did it, that it was a bad memory and it never happened. So let's get rolling. I think we could probably go ahead and start with this. If I can. There we go. Okay. Most pilots are self-depreciating, self-depreciating, deprecating, self-deprecating. If you find a pilot that brags a lot about how cool they are, run away from them. If you find a pilot who says they never screwed up, run away faster because we've all screwed up. Uh, and in 45 years, I know I've done way more than three or even 50. Uh, so usually the stories will start with, wow, I can't believe I survived this. And that's just kind of how we roll. So if you ever run into a guy who's bragging about how cool he is, you probably shouldn't fly with him or a girl. Okay. The first dumb thing we're going to talk about today that I did happened when I was a teenager. Uh, I was a line boy in Lakeland, Florida, starting when I was about 15 years old. And uh, when I was about, I guess, 16, this is when this started happening. The other thing I'll say is all the stories that I'm going to tell you of the three, there's not a single Cessna or Piper in them. 
and I apologize. I have to learn a lot of papers and says this, but we've got one Aronka Champ story and two MD-88 stories. And this one's the Aronka Champ story. Uh, let's see here. There we go. It was the 70s, early 1970s. Real men, I can't see my quote, but um, in the 70s, uh, men were real men, women were real women. And green guys from Alpha Centauri were real green guys from Alpha Centauri. And that's a quote from Douglas Adams, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, the champ in question kind of looked like this. Of course, this is a stock photo. That's not me trying to prop the thing. And the whole story is about me propping it by myself. But it was kind of painted that way, except on the uh, cowling in gold letters, I think it was italic letters, was painted the rock. The rock was, uh, was, I mean, in fact, I guess the next thing I want to show you. The rock was owned by a church. And I don't, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't even remember the name of the church, but the idea was, and people are still doing this, they were uh, getting, promoting their church and promoting, I guess, finding God. They thought they'd give free flying lessons and free flights and stuff like that. And so I became the most religious teenager in the world for a couple of hours while this guy checked me out in the rock. So I kind of, I'm probably going to go to heck because I kind of defrauded a religious thing to get free flying time. And boy, did I get a lot of free flying time. I flew that thing for five years. Uh, there you go here. There's a picture of me. The year they gave me permission was 1972. And I never, I don't think it worked out for them as good as they thought in terms of getting me in their flock. Uh, but it did work out for them because as a line boy, I could give them the best parking spot, actual real ropes, chocks. Um, you know, I made sure it was out of the weather. I took care of it. And then I flew it almost every day. And uh, it, one way we flew it, um, usually I flew with somebody else, obviously, and because uh, everybody wanted to go flying with me and the other line crew guys. And we got free fuel because what we would do is drag the fuel hose out of the truck, hold it up in the air and drain the hose into the tank. And then whoever bought fuel next would buy our gas, which I thought was nice. So not only was I defrauding a church, but I was stealing from my employer. It gave me a good start in life. <laughs> okay, now this is me in high school. I'm, I'm just a handsome guy. And then I went to college, I went to Florida State but every time I came home, I was home the first summer, then I got my CFI when I turned 19, so I started instructing in Tallahassee after that. But whenever I'd return to Lakeland on a weekend for a holiday, uh, whatever, I'd go out to the airport to fly this champ. I hadn't seen these guys in years, but they never told me I couldn't do it. They only told me I could. So it was there, there was no hops meter or anything. So I would just hop in it and go flying in it. And then one day I was flying in it, in 1977, and as I taxied up, there were four police cars there, and I, I saw the minister who was older now, and he was going to have me arrested for stealing the airplane. And I, apparently he forgot me from uh, when I looked like uh, this, and I changed to this. He didn't recognize me. But anyway, I haven't even got to the part where I screwed up yet in this story, but anyway, I didn't get arrested. I reminded him about it. And then he told me never to touch his airplane again. And I've been told by many people over the years never to touch the airplane again. So it wasn't that unusual for me. The other thing I'll mention about the champ is I never met God while I was flying the champ. Uh, well, I never found God when I was flying the champ, but I, I almost met her a few times. The stuff we did would be another whole talk. And it probably would be way more illegal. We took the door off. We flew semi-naked. We dropped stuff out of it. We chased cows with it. We just had a lot of fun with it. And it wasn't in very good shape. You could actually poke a hole in the fabric with your finger under the, under the fuselage. It was kind of, it was kind of verging on getting ready to kill you. But when you're 17, you don't care. Okay, here's the deal. It was on the side of the hangar. I wanted to go flying and I, not frequently, but every so often, I'd have to prop the airplane by myself. And you and the audience may be thinking that's not a good idea. And I agree with you. But I was a smart 17-year-old. So I had 
protocols to save things so it wouldn't be a problem. I chopped the wheels, I turned off the fuel cutoff is right by the throttles on the left side of the airplane. It's just a little flip thing. I turned the fuel off figuring if it got away from me, it would run out of fuel before it got too far. And I didn't tie the tail down. A lot of people would tie the tail down, but I tried that. And by the time I got around to untying the tail, the engine would quit because it was out of gas. So that didn't happen. So basically that was the setup for this little adventure of mine. Okay, here's what happened. I, I got the thing actually caught on the first prop, which is unusual for that engine, but it did. The throttle vibrated all the way open to full power. It, it's a 65 horsepower engine, so full power, you know, for that airplane, I guess it was okay. It jumped the chocks and started heading straight across the ramp. And across the ramp was, uh, I think Bernie Little owned the hangar at that time. He used to run the Budweiser and all the hydroplane boats and stuff, really nice guy. But his pilot, Joe Araldi, who was like an aviation deity on that field, what a, what a great guy, was standing at the Learjet watching this, and the airplane is tearing over toward the Learjet. It's going to eat it up. And uh, I grabbed the strut as it went by. I hooked it with my right arm and kind of tried to swing into the cockpit. But mainly, I just wore the tops off of my, off of my well, they weren't tennis shoes back then. They were sneakers. And I uh, put holes in my shoes on the tops. And uh, right about the time I got, it, it kept dragging me. I couldn't reach the throttle. And right about the time I got to uh, about five or 10 feet away from the Learjet, the engine quit because I had the fuel turned off. So I did one good thing. This did not happen. I didn't chew up Joe's Learjet. Uh, and then he took me <laughs> under his wing after I got my breathing back and tried to get my bleeding under control because I cut my arm too. Um, uh, I'll always go, and the thing was, I knew he was there, but like I said, he was aviation deity. I didn't want to approach him with holding my brakes or propping the airplane because, I mean, he was him and I was me. And uh, he reminded me that, he goes, Kevin, you know, all you got to do is ask. I'll, I'll help you out. So that was the time I almost killed the Learjet. And uh, I'm not going to say I've never propped it by myself since then, but you can it's interesting, you can actually hold the throttle back with a rubber band. And I, I added that protocol to the thing. And I didn't get arrested. And uh, we're going to move on to the second dumb thing. And these stories take about this amount of time. So if you want to step out for a coffee or something, that's fine. The second dumb thing Okay, let's see if I can find my Here we are. This has to do with the storm of the century. Of course, it was the storm of the last century because it happened in the 90s. Uh, big snowstorm. I'll go over the details here in a minute. I was an MD-88 captain. I'd been an MD-88 captain, I think a little over a year. I'd, I'd been a DC-9 captain before that. So I was a very young captain. I think I was 35, yeah, 35 years old. And I'm flying the MD-88 into Greensboro. It's the end of a long day. I don't think I've ever told the story where I'd say it's the end of a short day, but I'm sure we had them, but it's always, you know, how tired I was and all. Anyway, there's the facts on the storm of the century and an actual picture of an MD-88 being de-iced. Um, I'll let you read it. Uh, you guys probably remember it. It was uh, Nowadays, after a bunch of other storms we've had, I'm not sure it was the storm of the century, but it was a big storm. We flew into Greensboro that afternoon. It was a clear day, nice and kind of warm. You know how it's the warm the day before an ice storm. And uh, we were told that uh, maybe we should stand by so we could fly the airplane out in a few hours. And then I had a long talk because in the airline world, you're either laying over or you're not. And they didn't want to extend our duty time. So we went to the hotel and had a good night's sleep. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the hotel requires mention, it was a Ramada, and it's the only hotel in the system where they had free movies. They actually had a party room for us, a suite with free beer and Coke and popcorn and sandwiches, and the cable movies were free. So we would all get in our jammies and go there and watch movies and, and drink free beer. It was wonderful. It, it, was just, it was just a wonderful thing. And I can't believe later in the story, we're gonna leave there and not go back, but that's what happened. Um, there we go. 
okay, we're in an MD-88. We show up for work um, early. It was an early sign-in, and it was snowing really hard. There was already a lot of snow on the ground. And I'm a captain, and I'm going to complete the mission because, well, for one thing, it's only one leg home to Cincinnati. Then we're done. The trip is over. It's the end of a four-day trip. So we're all kind of anxious to get home. And I think I mentioned a hundred million times that I'm from Florida, so I'd, I'd been in snowstorms before. I'd been based in Chicago and all, but I'd never really thought much about it. It, it. Snow never scared me like thunderstorms did, because when I was a kid, I was never turned upside down by a snowstorm. But I had been turned upside down by lots of thunderstorms. Anyway, we pushed back. We de-ice, and back then you de-ice at the gate. There weren't a lot of rules for de-icing back then. Sounds like ancient history, but honestly, we didn't have. Now when you go on an airline trip and you de-ice, they take you to a pad, and they have procedures, you have to follow checklists and all that. But back then, it was just a guy with a truck that would come out and squirt the airplane. And usually, they'd argue with you about it. The mechanic, back then we had mechanics. That's another thing we used to have. And the mechanic would come out and say, Oh, the airplane looks fine. I'm sure, there's two feet of snow on the wings, but it's dry snow. It'll blow off. And, and, and anyway, so we de ice uh, because there's actual ice on the airplane. And then uh, we de iced again. And then we de iced again. As the hours went by, we were trying to get released, trying to get weather that was legal because it was about a 40 knot wind and about a little less than half a mile of visibility and blowing snow and freezing rain. And I was okay with this because. I'm going to get the mission done. It got, <laughs> it got to the point where when we taxied out, we were the only airline taxiing out. Everybody else had canceled and gone back to the hotel and started watching free movies and drinking. Um, but we were going to complete the mission. So we taxied out. And the problem was we couldn't de-ice enough. If we de-iced five minutes later, we needed to do it again. And we were already almost out of de-icing fluid. We used the station's whole supply of de-icing fluid for I think a two month period that day on that airplane. So some genius other than me who was going to complete the mission uh, did this. He followed me out to the runway. We actually taxied into position. Back then it was position and hold. It was a line up and wait. We were in position and hold on the runway with the de-ice truck de-icing us on the runway. And then we're cleared for takeoff. Yahoo. 50 knot wind down the runway but it's straight, in your, and it's straight in our face, no crosswind, driving, freezing rain and snow. And we're going down the runway and I'm thinking, well, the runway, by the way, is covered in snow and ice. And I'm thinking, well, this is okay because the wind's in our face. And I tell the co pilot I go, I'm gonna hold it on the ground a little bit longer than usual. And uh, okay, so we're about halfway down the runway, right about the part where I can't stop. We're at about hundred knots. I think VR was 120 that day. And then somebody was landing behind us. United 737 was landing behind us. He was at the outer marker. And then all we heard from him when he transmitted was a bunch of screeching and yelling about severe weight, uh, severe turbulence, uh, wind shear, 40 knot loss of airspeed, all the stuff you don't want to hear when you're plummeting down an icy runway about ready to take off. But we were committed. So I held a little forward pressure and the airplane leapt off the ground, even though I had forward pressure. It went 400 feet in the air and it didn't climb for another three minutes. Um, the airspeed went between 140, I think if I remember correctly, and about 280. It would just go back and forth. Uh, it was extreme turbulence, uh, heavy freezing rain. I think my co-pilot thought I was large Marge because I just, you know, I was locked in. I don't think he ever talked to me again after that day. I don't blame him. Anyway, after a few, we couldn't decide whether to bring up the flaps and stall or leave the flaps out and bend the wings. So what we did, I decided that I'd rather bend the wings since they weren't going to charge me for them than stall and kill everybody. So it was your basic, um, back then we had a wind shear recovery technique. We didn't have wind shear guidance or predictive wind shear like we do now. If we'd had predictive wind shear, I wouldn't have made the takeoff. It would have told me there was a wind shear. But I was a moron because I could have told that there was a wind shear, but again, I'm completing the mission. Um, anyway, so we left the leading edge devices and I think flaps, I think I went to flaps five. Normal takeoff for an MD-88 is flaps 15. No, I'm sorry, flaps 11. Um, anyway, um, about, I think a minute or two, it lasted about six months. And uh, we kind of finally climbed a little bit and cleaned up and 
we were on our way to Cincinnati, and that seems kind of inconsequential. Cincinnati's about an hour from Greensboro, and uh, pretty much moderate turbulence the whole way. And we got to Cincinnati and did a cat to approach in a snowstorm <laughs> and skidded to a stop. And in Cincinnati back then, it was a big hub. So we must, normally we'd have 40 or 50 airplanes on the ramp, just kind of like Atlanta or any other LAX or whatever. You're kind of used to seeing that picture. We were the only airplane there. And we taxied up and the gate agent parked us and asked us where the hell we were from. <laughs> and I go, well, we're from, I forget the flight number. We're flight 132 from Greensboro. And he goes, wow. I go, what do you mean, wow? He goes, well, we've lost the entire fleet. We don't know where the fleet is. And the fleet for the MD-88, we had 127 of them. And we're, we're, our airplane and maybe a couple others are the only ones that went anywhere. What had happened was everybody, when the storm hit, was diverting everywhere and then losing communication. So you had, you know, five airplanes in Shreveport and 10 airplanes in Norfolk. They completely lost the fleet except for our airplane. And of course, I almost killed everybody. I didn't mention that to them as they got off. And by the time we actually did leave, we had quite a few fewer passengers. They, a lot of them were smarter, smarter than me. So I'll talk about the lesson I learned later, but I'll move on a little bit here. Um, that, I guess the key is, um, I don't remember my profile telling me not to go. I think he wanted to go home too. So it wasn't like I was disagreeing with a, a co-pilot who was trying to save me, although I've been saved by co-pilots a lot. I usually, my theory has always been whoever's the most scared wins. And so if my co-pilot's more scared than me, we don't do it. You know, if, if you're, if I'm approaching a line of thunderstorms, you tend to get focused in, you, you, you're, um, it's not tunnel vision, I'm, it's hyper-focusing, I think that's what they call it, where I'm, if I'm looking at a line of severe thunderstorms, I'm trying to fly across it, I'll be so locked in, I may be telling the guy, okay, we're going to go 10 left and five right and go around this big one, and the co-pilot occasionally would go, well, Kevin, you know, if we go 40 miles to the left, we'll miss all of them, why don't we just do that? I'll go, oh yeah, okay, or if they go, well, I don't like this very much. Then I go, you know what? You're right. Let's not do that. Let's turn around. So. And the other th advantage being an airline pilot or a crew member on a crew is uh, they were always smarter than me. They always knew more than me. And I'm sure they worked harder than me. The deal on this situation, this is the list of things I figured out. Nothing that, about this thing was illegal at the time. At the time. Um, we didn't have guidance in our books about freezing rain. We would just, it was up to the captain and the mechanic. We would just figure out if we wanted to go or not. After this storm, Delta changed its guidance. We weren't allowed to take off in freezing rain. I think the FARs reflect that now. The FAA changed the rules too. Because you're nuts if you take off in freezing rain. You're just gonna, you're just, you're just asking for it. And uh, they changed that. And that was the beginning. It wasn't my particular screw up that started this off. Although I think I added to it. Uh, Delta and the other airlines started going to a more formal de-icing procedure after this, where we had holdover times, different types of de-icing fluid. Back then, we only had type 1, which you guys may not know, but it's basically just hot glycol. And type 2, they have type 7 and 8 now, but the, the type 2 stuff is kind of like a dippity do stuff they put on the wings that gives you more time before you take off. But anyway, they changed all that. Uh, 50 knots down the runway, not illegal. 50 knot crosswind would be illegal because 30, I had a 39 knot crosswind limitation. The other thing was, <laughs> once I was committed, I was committed. There were this whole idea, and this is another reason why I shouldn't have gone, because you're supposed to be able to abort. You know, V1 is a decision speed, and you're supposed to reach that decision before you reach V1. Well, I mean, at 80 knots, I was already committed. I couldn't stop the airplane without leaving the runway and hurting people. So anyway, dumb to dumb 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 Okay, I'll complete the story. We landed in Cincinnati. I did a John Boy Walton to get home. You guys may remember the, I can't remember the name, the pilot for, for the Waltons was all about his dad coming home for Christmas through the snow. I got two miles away from my farm and my truck finally crashed into one last snowbank and I had to walk the rest of the way home in my, uh, in my uniform shoes, you know, my, my ballet shoes. And uh, I always remember the minute I walked in the kitchen, my wife looked at me and said, what are you doing here? I didn't expect you today. And then the lights went out. We went without power for two weeks. So I could have been in a hotel watching movies, but no, I had to be home with no power for two weeks. Anyway. Okay. 
The third one, I'm going kind of faster, I apologize, but maybe we'll have time for people to say stuff other than me. Uh, obviously, these aren't movie stars. It's Homer Simpson, he's kind of my idol. Uh, and uh, he pretended to be everything at one time or another, just like I pretended to be an airline pilot. The third thing is also an MD-88 story. And trust me, I didn't almost crash MD-88s exclusively. I almost crashed DC-9s, 7-2s, DC-8s, uh, MD-11s. There's, there's a whole fleet of aircraft I almost crashed one time or another. And I only really crashed a plane once, and I, I it's just a Cessna 150, so I won't tell you about that story. But it wasn't my fault. This is basically a story of when you're on fire, it's important to know you're on fire. Uh, it's just handy to know that. Um, Age here. Okay. This is another winter story. Is December? I forget what year. Uh, we we had one last leg. It'd been a long day. Uh, about a fourteen hour duty day. Uh, they could run us up to. Uh, normally they wouldn't schedule us more than a twelve hour. A duty day is from when you report when you sign in until a half an hour after your your last flight ends. So this. Um, that's a duty day. And so you, you might fly uh, once or twice a day, a duty day, or you might, in my case, I think this day was a five leg day. I don't remember exactly, but they could run you, they could only schedule you for 12. They could run you to 15 and a half without asking your permission and anything after 15 and a half, they had to ask you. <laughs> and I've said no more than once to more than 15 and a half hours of duty. But that's basically a picture of me most of that day. Uh, we were going um, Cincinnati to Tampa in the evening. And uh, when we showed up to the airplane, both PAC fans were out. And I'll tell you what a PAC fan is in a second and why that's important. But it had other, it had other maintenance problems. But for now, we'll just talk about the two PAC fans. Uh, the PAC fans that were in op, they, they did what is called an MC, what our company calls an MCO. Other airlines call it something different. It's called a maintenance carryover. Basically, they pencil whip it. They just say, well, we're not going to fix this now. Uh, the FAA establishes rules about how long you have to wait to fix each certain item. It's the same way in an equipment list with general aviation aircraft. You have certain, you know, uh, rules about how long you can operate with it that way. They're a little more stringent with the airline. But with pack fans uh, were used to cool the um, air conditioning packs. Uh, the air conditioning pack is basically uh, kind of like your air conditioner, like a heat pump at home. It's a compressor and a bunch of stuff, and it creates heat as it operates. And these fans on the ground, when there's not enough airflow going over them in the air, you get a lot of airflow, so you don't need pack fans. On the ground, you run pack fans to keep the packs from overheating because it's not good when they overheat. Uh, matter of fact, if you've been around airliners, that's the loudest noise when you get on the airliner. What you're hearing, if you hear a loud whining noise, those are the pack fans running. Uh, nothing else on the airplane makes that kind of noise. And nothing else on the airplane um, is a bigger load, electrical load item. The pack fans are huge electrical load items. I think it was, I think it was 36 kVA when you started them. So they're big heavy duty motors and uh, they're nice to have, but you don't have to have them. You could MCO a pack fan being in op. I think they could go months and maybe weeks, weeks and months without fixing it. I don't remember the exact note in the, in the book, but they could go a long time. The thing that was significant was both of them were out. And I should have asked why. I mean, I kind of asked the guy why, but he didn't know uh, their procedure. Their main worry was that the air vent leading into the pack fan would be blocked by snow or a dead bird or a suitcase or something. The scoops are underneath, uh, the airplane, you know, the MD-88 they were. And their fix was to get a broom handle and stick it in the intake to see if anything pulled on the handle or uh, impeded the handle. So they signed it off. And once again, I'm going last leg to, uh, to a layover. And this is Christmas season, it's December, so we had a whole load of people. And this is what happened. We, uh, the procedure called for you to uh, not turn the packs on. Uh, in this case, it's December and it was cold, so they'd be providing heat, not cold air. But it doesn't matter. It's just different, different ports on the on the pack, and uh, they 
you don't turn them on. Uh, we've done a lot of no-pack takeoffs over the years. You in California may have experienced this on the 7-2. We do no-pack takeoffs going out of San Francisco because we were so heavy. We got a, a weight penalty by not running the air conditioning until we were in the air because it takes a bleed load off of the airplane engines. A bleed load is just air, air off the jet engines being used to operate the packs. So the procedure called for us to not turn the packs on until um, I think the way the book read was until the flaps were retracted. Uh, but we always did it when we were in the air because we assumed that we had airflow. The reason they did the, the flaps retracted is that's what starts the pack fans. On the airplane, whenever the flaps were not in the up position, the pack fans were, were operating. So that's the deal. And then no big deal, you're done. You don't need the pack fans in the air. So that's why they didn't actually have to fix it. Uh, so we uh, did that. Weather was, I don't know, three, 400 overcast. It wasn't terrible. The weather en route was awful. Uh, Atlanta had a lot of thunder. It was a wintertime thunderstorm night. Uh, we took off. I think we were flight planned for, um, I think for three, 33,000 feet, 330. Anyway, everything seemed to work. We took off. And right after we took off, uh, well, a lot of that's, so I can find my mouse here. There we go. It's one of my favorite slides. This is the way we always put it. Bad things started happening that made no sense. Uh, I can't remember the exact order we lost stuff, but you have to understand once we rotated, we were in hard IFR. In actual IFR, we're pretty much in actual IFR until we got to about Cross City, Florida. So um, it wasn't a, a matter of turning around or and, and you don't, the first three or four failures, you don't think that way anyway. I think the first thing that went out was my radio, my radar altimeter. But anyway, what happened was various and sundry electrical stuff started to seem to go out randomly. Uh, Copilot's ADI, my, uh, uh, the slow trim, uh, the, uh, the autopilot trim, uh, number one autopilot clicked off. Luckily, we only lost one DFCG, one digital flight guidance computer, because if you lose two, you're really in deep trouble. Uh, anyway, it just kept happening, and we kept climbing. And it, we were flight plan for 330, so I asked for 370, because we were in moderate turbulence at 330. And so we got to 370 right when the second autopilot quit, and we were on top, and my co-pilot's hand flying it. And we spent about the next hour uh, watching things slowly die. Uh, and uh, whistling to ourselves that this is okay, we're gonna be great. Been through this before, or this is no problem. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm trying to do some captaining in my brain. I'm thinking, holy crap, we need to divert somewhere. This is not good, because what if everything eventually goes out? And I didn't really know what was going on. Uh, but I had, two I had a couple factors that were bothering me. One was the, the obvious place to divert, because we're going Cincinnati to Tampa, I mean, would be Atlanta, we, you know, home base. Main, we used to have a maintenance base there. They don't do maintenance much there anymore, but we used to. And, uh, you know, divert in there, get a new airplane, you know, even declare an emergency if you want to. But the radar still worked. And, it, of course, it quit shortly after that. But the radar worked for a while. And looking at Atlanta, they just had a whole bunch of thunderstorms down there. And in retrospect, I think if I'd gone to Atlanta, they would have delayed us just enough that I probably would have killed everybody. Anyway, uh, we decided that Tampa had good weather. Uh, they were VFR and that we probably ought to just press on there. And that's what we did. So um, the reason I'm talking about whistling at 370 and hand flying, it, 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 for us general aviation guys, we laugh at that. Of course you should hand fly. You're a real pilot, you know. But in an MD-88, I don't have a picture of the profile. It's got a very thin wing and half a degree of pitch at altitude is like 800 feet per minute. So you got to be really sharp. And if you're in turbulence while this is going on, it's worse. And we were heavy for 370, which meant that we probably shouldn't have been there. And uh, it just goes on and on. So trust me, in the airline pilot world, having no autopilot and limited flight instruments at night in turbulence and weather is not fun. We didn't have a very good time with it. So anyway, let's see here what happened. Electrical systems failed one by one. Uh, that is, um, that's Jim Washout Puffinback from uh, this guy from uh, Hot Shots. You probably remember that. 
right about then our second autopilot quit, like I said, and uh, we were pretty much guided by this guy. We, uh, we did let Center know that we were having troubles. We were gonna let the company know that we had troubles. We have an A cars where you could send messages, text messages, but of course that failed sometime on climate. We lost that early. So we didn't have any, it, it, we could have tried to call them on company radio, but by then we were down to one radio and uh, we're talking to center on that. So I, I decided it really, they could clean up the mess when we got to Tampa. It wouldn't do any good one way or the other to tell them what was going on. Um, not to mention the fact that they probably would have encouraged me to divert to Atlanta, which as I said before was something I wasn't willing to do. So um, everything goes to poop, but we lucked out. Like I said, right around Cross City is when you start down. It's a three for one. So three for one plus 10 on a descent. So you start down about 120 miles out, if, if you're not familiar with that. And <laughs> we would have known that the FMS, we have two FMSs on board, uh, flight management computers. And we would have known that if we had any flight management computers, <laughs> but we didn't. We had one, one NAVCOM with a DME. We had my, um, I think I may be on the next slide. Let me see what we had left. Yeah. I had one NAVCOM, my flight instruments, Copilot's flight instruments were on the, on the uh, right DC bus. We lost the entire right, not the entire right DC bus, but a lot of it. And uh, he, uh, by some, he lost his ADI and his, 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 um, his DG actually worked because it was driven off of my DG, but my DG had failed. So anyway, it was a mess. We looked kind of like this when we finally got to Tampa. Uh, and then I'll tell you what happened in a second. But as we taxied in, we got to the gate, everybody got off. Uh, as far as I know, none of the passengers knew we had a problem. So they were happy. And uh, then we found out, by the way, this is uh, the, uh, from Blazing Saddles. This is Taggart, played by Slim Pickens. Anyway, next morning, we uh, were supposed to fly out and take that airplane back to Atlanta. It was a short layover in Tampa, and we we're supposed to take the airplane back. And we went to the airport, and they said, no, 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 you're not taking this airplane back. And they took us to the hangar. And what had happened was, and this may take a moment, I apologize. One of the pack fans had failed just because it failed. It just, the, the motor failed. The second pack fan shorted across whatever it shorted across. And since it was a high, a high load item, um, it started a, an electrical fire in a wire bundle. I don't know how many wire bundles MD-88 had. I'm sure it had plenty, but with the wire bundle in question is about this big around. And when they took us to the hangar, it was burned about 90% of the way through. It was just burned in half. So we, and, and this bundle, existed and lived in a non-pressurized area in the tail of the airplane, the, the, the tail cone area. Uh, so what had happened, and this is why we were so lucky and why uh, I'm still wondering, I think somebody's looking out for me. Uh, on the ground in Cincinnati, there was a slow burning electrical fire that nobody noticed. We took off from Cincinnati, it fired up a little bit. I think it had more airflow over it and it just started burning through little wires. And in a wire bundle, as you guys all know, they always try to put dissimilar systems in a bundle so that if you lose a bundle, you don't lose all the critical stuff. So that's why random stuff was going out. Uh, and we couldn't, of course, they don't ever teach us in school what's in which wire bundle, uh, obviously. So um, it burned all the way through. And uh, what saved us were a few things. One, I was stupid and that saved us. Uh, two, I didn't divert into Atlanta. If I diverted into Atlanta um, at high altitude, since it was not a pressurized area, there was no oxygen back there to support the fire. So our, our stuff going out actually slowed down at altitude. The fire slowed down. If we'd gone to Atlanta and got vectored around for 30 or 40 minutes and gotten in line behind 50 airplanes, we would have lost the bundle and it may have gone through another bundle. It may have started another fire. So I think that saved us. And, uh, the other thing that saved us was um, we landed in good weather uh, because I don't know how well I could have hand flown an ILS to minimums with just my instruments. It would have been tough. So let's see here. <laughs> Did I learn anything? Yeah, I mean, I could talk another hour or two about what I learned. Uh, I won't identify these guys, but you know, it's from the movie Airplane and he's just decided he shouldn't have quit sniffing glue. But uh, 
there's been a couple times in my career when I was younger that, that I was in a hurry to do things, uh, get the mission done. And then I realized later in life, that they paid me by the minute and I had a guaranteed pay. And that nobody would remember, none of the passengers would have a bad memory 10 years later of a delay. But if I crashed or hurt people, there'd be bad memories for way longer than 10 years. The other thing I realized is if I died doing something stupid in the airline, not only is that the worst thing a pilot can imagine, but they would, everybody would just move up on the seniority number and nobody would care. So I got to I changed my mindset from completing missions to trying to be as safe and smooth as I could be. And uh, they ran into trouble a few times later when the company wanted me to be a little faster, but it paid off for me. All right, there's this Vizzini from The Princess Bride. Good lessons, never start a land war in Asia. Never wear a mood ring when you're propping a champ. I did have a mood ring, by the way. And I think I was in a good mood that day. Um, also learn, even though you think you have to go home, you really don't. A night in a hotel, no problem. Two nights in a hotel, also not a problem. Because like I said, 10 years from now, you won't remember it. And I can't say this enough. There's been millions, not millions, there's been many times I've been legal and not been safe. And as I got older, I got better at recognizing this because the company or your passengers or your family or somebody is going to go, well, it looks okay to me. It's legal. And uh, yeah, but man, you can be really legal and really, really not in good shape. So, all right. Getting near the end here. I'd like to thank Aircraft Spruce again for sponsoring this. I'd like to thank you guys for hanging in here with me. Um, we'll open it up to some comments here in a minute. Uh, you know, maybe one or two, hey, you sure were stupid comments, and then we'll just assume I was stupid and, and just move on. But uh, anyway, thank you very much. And next year, let's do this in person. Because uh, talking to myself in this office is kind of weird. So thank you. Bye-bye.